Hi everybody, this is lecture number eight, the last one in the course about object-oriented programming where we discuss things which uh, in my opinion and hopefully in your opinion as well at the end of the course uh, are uh, not suitable for good object-oriented programming. We already discussed algorithms, that's how we started from, uh, that uh, writing the program in an algorithmic way makes it uh, less optimal, less object-oriented and uh, more difficult to maintain. Then we discussed static methods and static attributes that they are uh, not good for uh, object-oriented programming. We discussed getters and setters. Uh, I told you that, uh, in my opinion, mutability is something that uh, causes troubles for objects because they become larger, they become less maintainable, they become... Uh, they, they start looking like, uh, like data structures, like data bags, um, instead of being um, really behavioral things which uh, which encapsulate their own data and only expose behavior. And we also discussed this uh, very popular ER suffix which people add to the names of their objects like manager, controller, reader, writer. And uh, we, I believe, agreed that having this suffix is, a, uh, is an encouragement for the designers of the class for uh, for making the class more procedural and less object-oriented. Also, we discussed null references, which are also not suitable because, because there is no such thing in the, in the real world as null, so we should not make objects null. So it's, that's a philosophical problem, but more practically null makes, uh, leads to the code which, uh, which again, uh, more difficult to maintain. And we talked about uh, typecasting and uh, and the reflection mechanisms where you can detect what is the type of the of the of the object in front of you and by using this information you can treat your object differently and if you treat your objects differently uh, using the the different information using the information about their types that makes that makes your code again less maintainable because you uh, you kind of get into the internals the inside the, the the inside information of the object instead of treating the object as a as a black box as something which you cannot decompose you cannot um, unstructure it's something which is the structure of a pro of a project of an object is a perfect thing so we we should expect it to be that way so we don't uh, we don't test it we don't uh, we don't try to to take any parts of it and, and then make some decision and then according to this information which we retrieved then we deal with an object in a different way so today is the final lecture we talk about inheritance inheritance is something that most people a lot of people most researchers uh, who in some way complain about object-oriented programming, they complain about inheritance. This is the main, I think, the main uh, complaint point, the main weakness of, uh, the, the most obvious weakness of object-oriented programming. And if you read somewhere on the internet, you Google by object-oriented programming is bad or it's a problem or is, is wrong, then in most lectures and in most articles, you will see people complaining about inheritance. So they will tell you, look, object-oriented programs, they're full of this meaningless inheritance uh, structure. So some object, some class inherits another class and then they inherit another class. And this chain of inheritance, something that is difficult to understand, difficult to, uh, to, to maintain, difficult to work with. We will discuss it in this lecture. I'll tell you that, yes, I do agree with that, that, that inheritance is a problem. And I'll show you a few recommendations how to get rid of that, how not to use inheritance. And in the end, I'll show you something funny. I'll show you the quiz. You see the, the, uh, the, 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 third, uh, the third point. The third chapter of this lecture is I'll show you the, uh, uh, the, the piece of code in Java which I show to people who want to get a job in my team uh, for, for, for probably the last six or seven years. And I ask people to look at this Java code. It's pretty short. It will, be, it will fit into one screen. And I ask people to show me what are the problems they see in this code. And according to the answers, I will decide, I usually decide whether they are programmers uh, suitable for my team and I want to hire them or I decide otherwise. And this is the first time where I will discuss this, this piece of code publicly and I will 
express my opinion about this code. So why, what, what, I, what I believe people should pay attention to. So why I um, you know, judge them differently according to their answers. And it's a public piece of code. It's on, it's on GitHub, but I never discussed it anywhere in any lectures. I never expressed my opinion about this code. So you will, you will witness this, this for the first time. But let's start with polymorphism. So polymorphism and inheritance, they go hand in hand. So first, let's discuss the things which, which are the foundation of this, uh, of this big problem called inheritance. Let's start with something which I believe is good and which, is, which we all need to understand. A um, uh, long time ago, in 1987, uh, Barbara Liskov introduced a principle which is now known as Liskov Substitution Principle. And according to this principle, uh, it's quite formally explained principle, but that's a principle that, in simple words, it says that if uh, you can, if you expect, if, if some program, if some code expects me to provide a fruit, then if I provide an apple, a more specific thing, then that code should not break. So if you expected a fruit, then you should be fine with working with an apple. And if this happens, if you're okay with, if, if, if it happens, if, you're, if your expectation to work with the fruit, um, fruit is an example, and then you work with an apple and you work with a pear, pear, and you work with, a, uh, I don't know what kind of fruit, an orange, then, then the orange and an apple are the subtypes of a fruit. So that's basically the definition of subtyping in a system. So it's not just a definition that something is a subtype of something, but a program which, which expects things to be organized in types and subtypes, and this substitution works, then this is substitution principle, uh, which, is, um, which is true in systems which respect types. So that was kind of fundamental contribution, not kind of, but actually fundamental contribution to, to programming, to object-oriented programming. And later, that principle was uh, not reformulated, but explained in a simpler terms by Robert Martin. You probably know uh, this guy, very, very also famous, and uh, he, his contribution to, to programming, not only object-oriented, but this solid is, I believe, mostly about object-oriented programming. And the L part, there is a solid is a, is a, uh, is a package of five, princ five uh, not principles, five... Uh, uh, I would say principles, five things which you, if you respect, then your code will be solid. So your code will be uh, good, maintainable, good, everything like that. So L stands for Liskov substitution principle and Robert Martin reformulated it in simpler terms. That's a quote. So functions that use pointers or references to base classes, like fruit in my example. So this is base class and must be able to use objects of derived classes. So derived class is Apple, without knowing it. So that's important. So your functions, if your function is designed to, ex to accept a fruit, then I give you an Apple and I'm not telling you about that. So you just work with it without knowing that I gave you something more specific. So this, this uh, you know, uh, inevitably leads us to the, the hierarchy of classes. So of the fruit we can put uh, more like on the top and then we can say that uh, apple stays at the bottom. So this is the base class, base type. Okay, the Martin, uh, Robert Martin is using the word classes while the, uh, originally it was uh, the type. So we can say it's a base type. But, but in Java, you don't have types, so that's why people interchangeably use classes, types. We will, we will discuss it a little bit later, but it's better to have to use the word type because it's more, uh, it's more uh, logical and it's more suitable for, for that kind of a discussion. And Apple is uh, a, a derived class, a derived, again, a derived type. Derived type, base type. So this is the relationship of a parent and a child or a base and the derived type and whatever. And this relationship, they exist in everywhere. If you work with object-oriented programs and probably you do, then you know that they exist. So that's good. Now we're talking about this relationship, which is good. 
Remember that the, the, uh, the subject, the topic of the lecture is inheritance. And we claimed in the beginning that inheritance is, inheritance is a trouble. Inheritance is bad. But now I'm telling you that, 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 that this relationship is good. Fruit and apple, this relationship of a base type and a derived type is good. Without this relationship, you cannot have polymorphism. And polymorphism is when it's exactly this. Polymorphism means that uh, you expect something and I can give you what you expect in multiple forms. So it can take many forms, polymorphism, many forms. You expect the fruit, I give you apple, I give you orange, two forms at least, and I can give you many more forms. And, uh, and as long as you expect me to give you something that has certain proper properties, like a fruit, for example, a fruit has a, uh, a weight or a price. Let's say a fruit has a price. So you don't care when you deal with the fruit, you don't care about the, the color of the fruit. You just care about the price. And I give you the apple, the apple has a price and the orange has a price. So they both satisfy your expectations about the type fruit. So this relationship, parent and the child, is very important for object-oriented programming. Without them, we would not have polymorphism. Without that relationship, we would not have, I believe, object-oriented programming in general. Because it would be possible to do it, uh, you know, to work with, uh, with only objects, like in uh, JavaScript, for example. In JavaScript, you don't have that kind of relationship. In, in, in the classic JavaScript, I think the latest versions, they introduce something like that. But originally, JavaScript is just, every object is just a, a package of uh, attributes, and there is no thing like a type, to my knowledge. Uh, you cannot make, uh, you cannot say that I am expecting, there is no type control, let's put it this way. So there is no type system there, no at least it's not visible for programmers. So you cannot, in your code, you cannot explicitly say that I'm expecting a fruit and then there is a, the apple is coming and you, your, your programming language, JavaScript, cannot uh, check in runtime or in compile time that uh, it's not an apple, it's like a car, for example. But in languages which have type system, and if this type system is visible for programmers, which usually it's called uh, strong, uh, strong type system or strong typing, then uh, the types are being controlled in compile time. So I'm, I'm writing the code and in the code I'm saying I'm expecting a fruit and I, I say it to the compiler and then the client of my code is sending me something and if this something is not a fruit by, but for example, a car, then the compiler will stop right there and say I cannot compile this code, that's it. So that's considered to be good for many reasons, like control of the code, uh, uh, maintainability of the code, the more you control, the more, uh, in general, the more strict is your programming language, the more, um, uh, the more, the tighter it controls uh, the code you write, uh, the more maintainable will be the code. So the less mistakes you will make and the, the less mistakes, the more mistakes are being caught in compile time, the less mistakes will go to to runtime. That's a, a, a topic for a, a different lecture, but now just let's establish that uh, types and relationship between types, like subtyping and subtypes and, 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 uh, and um, supertyping. Supertype, this is the supertype, another name. This is a supertype and this is a subtype. So there are another two names, base, base type, derived type, super type, subtype, or parent type, or child. That's good. Okay, let's move on. So for the subtyping, I, I give you an example. Like what is uh, subtyping? Again, I'm, I keep talking about things which are good. We're not yet in the section which will be about inheritance. So this will be bad. So now we're talking about things which are good. Okay, so subtyping. Look at the look at the code on the left. We have a, a figure, let's say figure on the canvas, and then we have the circle and we have the polygon. They both extend the type figure. It's it's Java, so in Java we don't have types, we have so-called interfaces. So that's the interface figure, and then inter interface says everything that is a figure is supposed to have a matted surface. So I would like to calculate what is the surface of the, of the figure. And then the circle is the, the subtype of the figure and it has additional property, additional method, perimeter. And the polygon has also additional property, sides. So it means that this is a supertype. The figure is a supertype. And circle, it has additional method 
which is called perimeter. And this one has additional method, which is called sides. So when I make an instance of polygon, then I will have the ability to calculate how many, to get how many sides the polygon has. If I make an instance of a circle, I will be able to get the perimeter of the circle. So there will be no perimeter in polygon and there will be no sides in the circle. And there will be no perimeter, no sides in the figure. The figure will only have the method surface. That's the idea. And this is how you define, how you, uh, in you, you, if you, if you write the formula, you can say that circle is a subtype. This is the symbol which which uh, academic world uses for the different for the uh, for um, in order to define the relationship between the subtype and the and the supertype. Or you can use it this way, also same same symbol, the same the same idea. So that's good. Why it's good? I just explained to you because it enables polymorphism. This is where the polymorphism. Uh, shows up. So look, the paint method, I say, give me the figure, and then from the figure I get the surface. I don't care what exactly will come to me at this at this place. This could be a circle, it could be a polygon, it could be, uh, it could be whatever, as long as it is a figure. So as long as it, it could be whatever you define, but as long as your, uh, your class, well in Java it has to be a class, which implements the interface. But what matters for this point in the code is that what's coming is a figure. People usually, usually sometimes they say the relationship called is a. So it means that f is a figure. You can, you can see this uh, name of the relationship in, uh, in UML, for example, in, uh, uh, in, in, in different, uh, I think, more uh, more classic uh, literature than now. So now it's, I think it's less used. So now it's, people just, I don't think they use it that often, but before I saw it in the books, is a relationship. So it means that F is a figure. And if you can say that, that F is a figure, then it means that the, the, type, uh, the type constraints are being satisfied. So when the F is coming, we just check and see whether it's the right type, whether it's coming. So that's good. Subtype, subtyping is good because it enables polymorphism. Why we want this to enable? Why can't we just say that paint and then instead of figure make the specific uh, name of the class? Let's say I expect here the circle or I expect here the, uh, the, the circle on the canvas or some more specific class. That's the, the same as we discussed many times. It's about the coupling. Because if this method paint is connected with the figure, so this is one type of coupling, but if it is connected with polygon, it's a more tight coupling. But if from the polygon you will implement some more specific class, I don't know, the poly, like maybe polygon is, uh, a rectangle could be the polygon, right? Rectangle with the four, with the four sides. So you can say, okay, I expect, I accept only the rectangle in, in your method pane. So in this case, you increase coupling. You made it. You increase coupling between your method pane and uh, and what's coming to you. And more, the more coupled they are, the more difficult it will be for future programmers to to have the freedom on that side of the equation here. Because if you're coupled with the figure, I can be quite creative in the implementation of the figure. I can implement my own figure, which will be not even the circle, not the polygon, but something completely different. And you still will be okay with that. So as long as I provide the method surface, you will be okay with what I'm giving to you. And that gives me a lot of freedom. And the more freedom I have on this side, the better. So the, the further we stay apart, this side and that one, the, the bigger the distance between us, the less we know about each other, the better. Like I told you before, the less I know about you, the better in, in, in the design. So try to make your code the way that uh, the, peop the, the, the code that uses your code doesn't need to know too much. And also you don't need to know too much about them. You just need what's enough. You need to know what's in you know what is enough. So here what is enough is just you're a figure, you have the surface, that's, okay, that's enough. So types and subtyping that gives you this ability. Gives you the ability to be more flexible, which leads to, to, to less 
coupled design, the, the lower the coupling, the higher the maintainability. That's the bottom line. Lower coupling, higher maintainability, less bugs for production, more happy customers. That's the, that's the bottom line of this entire course. We need less coupled design, higher maintainability, and then more happy customers. Okay, this is subtyping. Let's go next. Again, where polymorphism is being used. I'm just, you know, making you the, uh, the introduction to polymorphism so that you see that we actually need types and we need supertypes and subtypes. So inheritance is not, uh, by the definition, is a bad idea. Something else is a bad idea. We'll discuss it a bit later. So take a look. This is called parametric polymorphism. I actually didn't know that it's called parametric polymorphism until I started to prepare this lecture. I knew this name, generics. So generics we use in programming a lot, and in Java especially, in many other languages they have generic. So look at the code on the left. The code on the left doesn't have generics. So I need to design you know, one class for, like I, I'm designing a stack. So this is a stack of strings, you know, the stack structure, you can push, you can pop. And then another stack of numbers, stack of integers. And then I use it here. In this code I use stack of strings and I can push the string right there. And here I use stack of integers and I can push the integer. I need to implement them twice. There are two implementations, which are very similar. They're not identical, of course, because working with the string and working with the number, it's a different story, probably, internally. But a lot of things are very common. A lot of things are similar. And at the level of Java, we can make them, we can say that most of the things are similar at the level of Java. When it's going to be implemented, when it's going to be compiled, then of course the difference is, is bigger because dealing with the strings and dealing with numbers, that's definitely different for, for, the, for the CPU, for the computer, that's different things. But on the level of Java, they're the same things. So in Java 6, I believe, they invented uh, generics. So before in Java 5, we have uh, we didn't have the ability to have generics, so that, that was Java 5. We were have to do it like this. That was the design in Java 5. And then in Java 6, that was kind of breakthrough. That was kind of a, a breakpoint or really important release when they released Java 5. They Java 6, sorry. They introduced uh, generics. So you define the type here and you say my stack requires a type uh, in order to be created. So if you want to make an instance of my class, then you need to tell me what is the, what is the type I'm going to use. And then this T is used, you see, is used everywhere inside the body of the class. So when I write this code, I don't know what is T. I don't know what's going to be supplied here. I don't know whether it's going to be a string, it's going to be a number, it's going to be another class. It could be anything. So when I write this code, I kind of make a template. In C++, they call it template. In Java, they call it generics. So I just write a class which is not a real a concrete class. It's, it's like a template of a class. In order to make a real class, I need, to, I need to provide, I need to specify what is that T. And when I give the T, the Java compiler just says, ah, you meant string. There you go. So here's your class. So then when I provide string, then at this point of time, Java compiler understands what I meant and it builds the entire code of the, uh, of the class. I mean, it may technically not work exactly like I explained inside the compiler, but that's the, the high-level idea. So before the T is specified, before this um, uh, generic parameter is given, we just have a template. We just have a, a sketch of a class, something that is not uh, written in stone. I mean, we, just, we just have an, an ex like. It's a, it's a draft of a class. And then we put T everywhere, and then the compiler just put, instead of T, it puts string, 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 string everywhere, and boom, you have the real, real class. It could be a number of parameters. You can define class like this. You can say my stack is T, and this, I don't know, Z, and then U, and then it, mean, it, it will mean that you need three parameters to make a real class. So you have three unknown, three places where, where the type is unknown, where you don't know what is the what is the real type? Okay, um, so in order to use it, look at what's, what's happening here. We define stack 1 here, stack 2 here, and in both cases we use the same class. Stack, stack. It's very convenient. It really, uh, it really uh, reduces the amount of code which, uh, which we need to write. We just use one name of a stack and then the parameters are coming here and then we have, we have two classes actually. Actually, in reality here, 
and here Java compiler will create exactly what we did here. But it will be done behind the scene, we will not see it, so the code will look shorter, everybody wins. Okay, so para it's called parametric polymorphism. It means that the, the stack behaves differently. It has two forms at least. This is one form. This is form number one. This is form number two. So it's polymorphism. Many forms, but you provide the parameter in order to get the form, in order to, to change the form of, a, of something, of a class. So it's called, I believe because of this, it's called parametric polymorphism, which is usually called generic. Okay, and the last point about uh, polymorphism, also I didn't know that, it's called ad hoc polymorphism, but I knew the name uh, method overloading. Method overloading, probably you know about that, what it is. Look at the code on the left. Let's say I have a shopping cart, and in the shopping cart I can add the product ID by the number, and then add the product ID by the string. So I want to use it like this. I make the new cart, and then I say add 42, and then add 17. Here I provide the string, and here I provide the number. So I want, for my convenience, to let this card deal with the number and then deal with the string. So I want the card, when I add the number, to automatically parse the number from a string and then add it to add it as a number. That's a very synthetic example. I don't know in which shopping cart it might, might happen, but something like that I see quite a lot in the code. It's, it's just for convenience. It's more convenient for, uh, for people to, uh, to design it this way because we want to make our clients happy. So we want to please the client. So when we do that, we just, uh, we just uh, want the client to, to use us in, in, um, in more different ways uh, comparing to um, Comparing to how the client would do if we would only give the client uh, a single method add. So if the only method exists, like this one, then the client has to do the, the string parsing on, on its side. And we have many clients and every client has to do the same. So many clients will have to do, uh, will have to do string parsing in their code. It's inconvenient because it's code duplication. So it's better to do it on our side. We just say, hey, here's a convenient method for you, so please come to us with a string, with a number, with whatever you want. But the problem with that is that there are two names, add and add string. And uh, these two names, they kind of mean the same. The semantic of that is the same. It's just the, the suffix string is actually telling the user about the type which is coming. So it's kind of a duplication of information. Add string, string. You see, we use string two times. Add string, add string. So we, we duplicate the information. This, this signature of this method is much better. Add, and then the number. So the method itself doesn't, doesn't carry the information about the type which is being used. And it's in general is a bad idea to, uh, to duplicate the information about the type in the in the class name, in the method name, in the, in the variable name. So it's, you know, in general, I, I'm sure you understand, but in general, it's a bad idea to name, uh, to name a variable, for example, uh, I don't know, user, uh, let's say, name, string. So that would be a wrong idea to give a name to, uh, to, to, to a variable. So you, you remove that part because you already say that this is my type. So the type information goes somewhere in the compiler or somewhere in, in, in the syntax of the text, whatever. But this type information should not be uh, incorporated in the name of the variable because it's a duplication of information and because it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, again, it is a coupling. You tell the client too much about yourself. So the client starts knowing that your variable is named string, that the type of your variable is string. And this information is, must be internally, it must be known only to your variable, must be known internally. I may be speaking now quite philosophically because technically the client will see the type of your variable, right? When you assign it somewhere, when you say name equals, and then the, 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 the ID, the compiler, they will all tell you, hey, only the string can put there. So you cannot do 42 because that's going to lead to compile time uh, problem. So the information is visible, but adding it even after the name and, and saying like this name string, 
that's kind of even more coupling. You're, you're saying again, you, you're making your client know too much about you. And if tomorrow, let's say you decide to rename, let's say you, you change the type of your string, let's say it was name, and then instead of string, you're going to do, uh, in Java, we have a we have a type called char, uh, I think, char sequence, something like that. So that's the type which is, uh, which string is, uh, is a, is a base, is a child from. So let's say tomorrow, instead of using string, you change the type to, to char uh, sequence. And then everywhere, and then you, you cannot change this name, right? Because everybody knows about your name. Everybody knows that you are actually name string. So they know your, so they know your, uh, your type. So changing, and then you decide to change your type. You decide, you decide to do something which, which is, is your business. You want the type of your variable. You want you are the variable, so you want to change your type. But your name is attached to the old type, and everybody knows you by that name. So it's again philosophically is wrong. If people know you by if people know that you're not just a name, but string name name as a string, then um, let's say you're a, you're a person, and uh, your name is. Jeffrey, for example, and then uh, and then you say, I'm Jeffrey student. So student is your type and Jeffrey is your name. So you say, I'm Jeffrey dash student. So everybody will know you as Jeffrey a student. Then you graduate. You're not a student anymore. But we all remember that you are Jeffrey student. And if you if you try to change that type, you say, I'm not a student. I'm a, I'm a I don't know, somebody else. Like now I'm Jeffrey uh, designer. Oh, I'm a Jeffrey artist. But no, 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 you're a student. We all remember that you're a student. So it will take a lot of time to go around uh, <laughs> around your um, circle of friends and tell everybody, please don't call me Jeffrey student. Please call me Jeffrey designer. The same with the variables. So if you say name string, it means that you will have to go around the code and tell everybody, I'm not name string anymore. I'm name uh, char sequence. Please rename, please rename. So that's coupling. So they know too much about you. They, your friends know too much. They know that you're a student. You disclose this information to them. And that's the, that's the mistake. So don't disclose. Say, I'm Jeffrey. You know, we want something from me. Come with your request. I'll do it for you. You, you, you want to, me to do something for you? I'll do it. But don't, you don't need to know that I'm a student. This is my type. My type is my business. The same here. So it's bad. That's the bad idea to say add string. So method overloading helps us. So we can say, we can define two methods with the same name. And compiler, not in every programming language. For example, in JavaScript, it's not possible. In JavaScript, you cannot define two, uh, two methods with the, uh, with the same name. Just not going to work. It just, the compiler will just fail. In PHP, for example, you can also not do that. In uh, many other languages, in Ruby, I think in Python as well, you cannot do it. So only some languages like C++, Java, maybe C Sharp, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but maybe. Uh, they are, in my opinion, more powerful languages and they allow method overloading. Uh, so then you define add and add to exactly the same name, but the signature of the method is different. So this is called signature of the method. Signature is the, the parameters, which are types of parameters which are coming in and the type of result. This is usually called signature of a method. So signature is different, name is the same, and that's acceptable for the language. So you can do it, now you can write the code like this. We use exactly the same name, and that's semantically is more readable. Look, this, is, this looks ugly to me because it's of this coupling to the type, and this looks, it looks nice to me. But let me, summarize, let me finish this section about uh, method overloading. I believe it's not a good idea to have method overloading in the code. So if you have that, you kind of introduce confusion to your clients because they don't know what is the difference between these two methods. Ideally, there should be no difference. Ideally, you should say that this add method does exactly the same as the, another add method. But you cannot in real life maintain this, this promise. You cannot hold this promise for all the cases. So if you start using method overloading, you inevitably will create two methods with exactly the same name different signature and different semantic. So they will do something, something will happen differently in them. And it will be hard to explain to the user because you have exactly the same name. So I expect exactly the same behavior. 
And then you need to, you will start writing a long documentation for this method, explaining that no, 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 don't call that method because there is some side effect, call this method because there are less side effects, and so on and so forth. So there could be, like even in this simple example, there could be two different mechanisms. Let's say, let's say this method actually fails. So what happens in this in this scenario? When I call hello world. So here we're gonna have exception. So there will be an error. But here there will be no error, never ever. So, but or it could be other errors if the product ID is wrong or something. But here we definitely have an, some extra error, some error which which there we cannot see. So that's a different behavior. So that means the semantic of these two methods are different, and uh, and that is hard to explain to the user if your names are exactly the, if your names of the methods are exactly the same. But this is called ad hoc polymorphism. I don't I can't even explain why it's called this way, but I know this name, method overloading, which is good. So this is all about polymorphism. I told you everything you need to know, at least for now, about polymorphism. And all of this is good except for method overloading, but that's my personal taste. So I told you this my my feeling that uh, it's not it's not good, but overall it's being used actively and this does not cause problems the problems which inheritance brings to the table so let's continue to the second chapter which is about implementation inheritance we need to understand the difference between things which we discussed which is called types and subtypes and implementation inheritance there are two different things the first one is good the second one this one is bad that's not good and some people told, to, told us about that. It's not me who is saying that. For example, that was probably mm, the, the article which was published in 2003, 20 years ago, by a famous um, expert in object-oriented programming and also in Agile. So uh, that's a very famous guy, um, Alan Holub, who uh, said in his, in his uh, article published in InfoWorld that extends, that was about Java, by the way, the extends keyword, he's talking about Java, is evil. Maybe not at the Charles Manson level, but bad enough that it should be shunned whenever possible. So he's saying in his paper 20 years ago, don't use the extends keyword. And he means this, class A extends class B. So this is wrong. But he doesn't mean this. Interface A extends B. Or interface Apple extends fruit. Or interface circle extends figure. He's not talking about this. No. He's talking about this. So that's evil. This is evil. This is good. This is on the left side is subtyping, which is disgusting. This is implementation inheritance. Why I'm using the word implementation and why inheritance? Stay with me. Another quote, interesting, about the same problem, which uh, actually he said that according to Alan Holub, that uh, James Gosling, James Gosling is the father of Java. He's the guy who created Java as a language. So uh, someone asked this guy, the James Gosling, if you could do Java over again, what would you change? What would you do different? And the answer is, I would leave out classes. It's some sort of a maybe joke, but I don't think it's really, there's more truth in this, in this saying than the joke. So he's saying basically that classes is something that do not belong to object-oriented programming. Classes. Not interfaces. So interfaces are types. Classes, not types. There's something else. So James Gosling is saying types, uh, interfaces, types, they stay. Classes, they cause problems. They lead to problems. That's his words, not mine. And I agree 100%. So let's see what it means. 
this is probably the, the main slide I want to show you about uh, implementation inheritance. Look at the code on the left and um, see what happens here. Uh, there's a class square, square, a rectangle, well, square, right? And this square has the width, okay? And we have a method surface which calculates what is the surface of this, of this square by, by multiplying width by width. So far so good, that's our class. And then the evil starts. The evil part. We say class circle. I create a circle and we extend the square. So we say, yeah, there it is. So we say the circle extends the square. So circle is a sub class over of a super class. And I say circle, I in input the radius of the circle and I put this radius as a width of the square. So here I call the super, the constructor of the square. I, I skipped the constructor there, my mistake. So radius goes into here. Okay. And then I define the method surface, which was there in the square. So I redefine, pay attention. So I override this method. So now in the, squ in the, in the square, we had the method surface. And here we have the now the method surface. So if somebody will come to the circle from there, they will ask the surface, this method will be called, we will get the, 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 the pi, the p number, and then we call the super dot surface. So basically this one will be radius multiplied by radius and multiplied by here. So this will actually make us the square of the circus. So what happened here, that's silly. This implementation is kind of weird and wrong. I, I, it's, a, it's quite a simple example. Of course, in real life, we have more complex examples. But this is a simple example to demonstrate to you how the, ex, the mechanism of extension can abuse the logic of the program and how we actually, instead of... Um, instead of um, uh, instead of maintaining the relationship of a supertype and subtype, we introduce something completely different. The circle is not a square. A circle may reuse certain behavior from, and not from the square. Yes, we can say that multiplication of the widths by the widths may be multiplied by pi. Indeed, it's going to be the, the surface of the, of, the, of the circle. Indeed, one single property can we can say that yes the surface here is kind of some some feature from there can be indeed reused there but this relationship is not wrong is not right the circle is not a square if we tomorrow introduce some other property here for example the square has i don't know the square can um, uh, can have uh, i don't know what what can we do for the square which 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 is not a circle, which will not fit into a circle. Uh, let's say, uh, what can we do with the square, mm, which we cannot do with the circle? Uh, okay, let's say we calculate the sides. So, so square definitely is a polygon. So it's a polygon with four sides. So I introduce tomorrow, I put the, the, another method here, which will be int sides, and it will return number four. So now my circle will start returning four. I introduce my method there and automatically this method will show up in the circle and the circle will start returning four sides. And it will be quite difficult for me to understand why it's happening unless I carefully study the relationship between this circle and the square and so on and so forth. So by allowing this inheritance, it's called implementation inheritance, because we uh, inherit the implementation of the square. So square had certain implementation. This is the implementation 
This is part of implementation, the functionality. And here we use this, we inherit. Well, inherit, I think it's a, it's a wrong word to be used. So people start using, people decided to use the word inheritance instead of saying reuse. I think the better name is uh, for this mechanism is reuse. So we just reuse the code, which already stay in the square. It stays in this, in this super class. And we say, hey, how about we, 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 we reuse it? So here I explain, I wrote some, uh, some wording there. So here I say that the circle is not a square. It merely reuses the code that was, le that was negligently left open in the square. By the negligently, I mean that people who created the class square, they were not thinking about other programmers who may come into the future to this code base and say, hey, we have the multiplication functionality there. So we already have a class square and look, we need the multiplication here. How about we reuse it right from there? So I don't want to rewrite. I don't want, I don't want to write multiplication in my code because I found it somewhere. There is an extension mechanism. So I can just reuse that part of functionality. I can just take it from there, but not take it. I don't copy it from there because I, I don't want code duplication. So I found it there. The multiplication stays in this comfortable place and nobody can stop me from extending this square class. So I just extend it. I don't care that my circle actually is not a square. I don't care that this line is actually very, very red. So it, that's why I put it in a red color because actually circle is not a square. But people lose this idea of, of, sub, of, uh, of what is what. Of, of their, remember I told you, is a. So this is, if people think in the terms of is a, they will immediately see that circle is not a square. Like I said here, is not a square. This is the relationship is not. But in more complex examples, when the code is more complex, like controllers, models, views, all the kind of things which are synthetic, which we discuss, readers, writers, where people don't really know what they're dealing with, they can easily forget about is a relationship. And they're just thinking in terms of code reuse. They just see the code which can be reused and they just jump in there and, and, re and extend from there. They extend and they, they become happy because they didn't rewrite, they didn't, uh, they didn't copy, they didn't, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't do the code duplication. They just found in there and they reused. When they, they, they make many of such connections, of, reuse, of reusing connections, then the code turns into a mess. So if you look at a, some large Java projects, especially old ones, because in, in the, like 20 years ago or 10 years ago, people didn't know that much about inheritance. They believed that this is that inheritance is the same as subtyping. So they, they've heard that types and relationship of parent and child is good. Like in the first chapter of this lecture, they know about this. They, they've learned about that. Liskov principle, this uh, relationship of the, the polymorphism. It's all like really nice things. So they decided to use it inside this inheritance mechanism, which is not the same as subtyping. It's a different story. It's a different story because we, instead of saying that, uh, um, instead of, so actually we, in this code, let me try to explain why it's, why it's not the same, why it's not the same as subtyping, why it's different. Because remember in subtyping, remember the principle of Liskov, the, of, of Barbara Liskov. The principle says, uh, if your system is, uh, Expect, is expecting uh, a fruit, then I'll give you the apple and the system should not break. Here, if you're expecting a square and I'm giving you the circle, then your system can easily break because I, uh, I changed the implementation of the square. That's how I understand the, the, the difference. So here we're not saying that circle is a, uh, is a, you know, is this relationship which we have between types, for example, between, the, um, between a, an apple and the, and, the, and the fruit. This is the, the, this is the arrow. I'm using this arrow from uh, UML. 
So in UML, they use this arrow to say that that's the kid and that's the parent. So in this case, I'm just saying that Apple has all the, that Apple looks and be, uh, that Apple um, exposes uh, the behavior which you would expect from the fruit. But the implementation of the fruit and the implementation of the apple, we don't discuss them in this, uh, in this relationship. They may have different implementations. But in this case, this is the specific implementation which exists in the surface. And we inherit this implementation there. So we, we just, uh, we, indeed, we inherit it. So we take the code, technically, we take the code which is located there, and we say, now we should be able to use this code over here. So it's not about um, having the properties, the behavioral properties. It's not about saying that I look like an apple, you look like a fruit. So we are uh, a child and a parent. But that's about you behave something and I and I I'm gonna use your behavior, I'm gonna I'm gonna reuse your behavior and add my own behavior. So it's a it's a different story. That's my point. It's a different story. This extends keyword is not the same. Unfortunately, in Java, the same keyword is being used for the relationship between interface to interface and a class to class. Luckily, for the interfaces, we have the word implements. So if I say that my circle is a figure, then I say my circle implements the figure. That's good. But unfortunately, Java is using the extends keyword both for relationship like this and relationship like this. That's a confusion. So that's why well, maybe that's why people confuse subtyping with implementation inheritance. So this is terrible, horrible. We don't do that. That's bad. This is perfect, good for design. I am not 100% sure that I managed to explain you the difference, but maybe in the next few slides will help you understand. Okay, this is the quote from my blog post, and I decided to put it here. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use, the, uh, to use the meaning of the word to explain my idea better. So in, this is the quote from, uh, this, this line goes from uh, the dictionary. Inheriting, inheriting means receive money, property, or title as a heir at the death of the previous holder. So this is the meaning of the word inheriting. So somebody is dead, so we take it from that guy, some money or whatever. So now the question is, who is dead, you ask. So when we inherit from the square, so the square is dead. So we kind of, an object is dead if it allows other objects to inherit its encapsulated code and data. That's my philosophical understanding of the problem. So when you are able to take the piece of this square and put it into circle, then the square is, is a dead guy because it allows us to do that. It shouldn't. So what's the alternative? The alternative is called Composition Over Inheritance. It's a very famous uh, title for many, many, many papers which you can Google and read and see that they will convince you what I'll try you to, to convince in just one slide. So Implementation Inheritance on the left. We just saw this code. This is exactly what you saw a minute ago and that's a mess. You don't do that because by using this, this inheritance relationship you will eventually get to the code which is very difficult to maintain because because the relationship between these classes will not be uh, clearly explainable. It will be difficult to understand what they mean and why they, uh, they, they stay like that. Why the circle extends the square? That's going to be a huge question for you. Even in this simple example. Because you will just say, why? Circle is not really a square. Circle is circle. Square is square. Yes, they have certain commonalities. They have certain uh, similarities between their implementation. But on the higher level, they are not bound by this uh, relationship of is a so to prevent this from happening you do this you put the final keyword in your class if you put the final keyword nobody will be able to inherit to to inherit your class square nobody will be able to say extends square just by putting this final keyword in front of your class every class i'm saying every class should have this final keyword. Every class in your code base should be final. Just make it a make it a habit for you. Just do it every time. Every time you make a class, it's final. So in this case, what can I do? If it's final, then I make the class circle. I need to 
encapsulate the, the instance of a square. And then I do radius is coming here and I say okay s is there so I make new square radius so I do functionality will be the same I will also reuse the functionality of the square but it's going to be like this so now we don't have the relationship is a between the circle and the square now circle is not a square is not here it's is a this is is not so now they are they're staying completely separate and yes, in order to reuse the functionality of the square, we're saying, all right, we don't want to do my multiplication in here, so I'm going to reuse it like this. That is, this is perfectly safe. That's called composition. This is called inheritance. This is called composition. This is good. This is bad. All right. And that's my recommendation to you. All classes without exceptions should be either final or abstract. Abstract is a, the keyword which you can put in front of your class which means that you are interested in other classes to extend you. It may happen. Sometimes you may welcome, you may have sometimes inheritance relationship when you really mean that something is a something else. When you really have some some super class and then you have uh, other subclasses and then subclass one and subclass two and they really and then and this is super class so they really they really abound through the relationship is a is a in this case you put the keyword here abstract you say my class is abstract so it's not complete so in this case nobody will be able to instantiate this class nobody will be able to say make me an instance of this class and then and then deal you're just saying that this class is is a temporary it's like a template Remember the generic, so it's it's somehow uh, close to that. So it's abstract, which nobody can use directly unless they really make a subclass first. And then you make a subclass, subclass, and then from here you can do new operator, new, and then S2 and whatever. But that's not so often. So I suggest you to stay away from this abstract keyword also. So don't do that unless you really know what you're doing. So just make your classes final. And you will be safe. Your design will be much better. You will just move to uh, a different level of programming if you follow this recommendation. All classes, no exceptions, without exceptions, should be either... Well, either final or abstract, there is definitely no exceptions. Sometimes you may have abstract, sometimes. But usually, don't do it. A few more slides, and then we go to the quiz, which I promised to you. So there is a, another thing which... Actually, this is the, the main reason why people complain about inheritance. They say that there is a multiple inheritance and, uh, and this may cause even more problem. And this, this may, may lead to a huge trouble. Let's say we have the, the pi uh, class which returns the value of a, of a pi. And then we have a square. You saw that before. And then we define the circle. And we say class circle extends square and pi. In Java, we don't have uh, double extension, so we don't have multiple inheritance, but this is C++, or very similar to C++. So we extend them both. And then there, the calculation is this. We take something from pi, we take something from, from square, and multiply and return the result. It is a code reuse. We reuse the feature, the code from there. We reuse the code from, from here because we believe that we need code from here and from there. But look at this very, very questionable diagram. The circle now is at the same time a square and a number pi. That's a complete mess. Because it's not, because this, this circle is not a number and the circle is not a square. But yes, circle internally, in order to work, circle needs certain functionality, it needs to inherit certain functionality from this poor guy and from this poor guy so they they're dead so they give what they have to this one it's just very weird it just looks this diagram looks extremely extremely uh, strange for the people who try to think in terms of objects and in terms of their relationship like uh, who is who and who is a subtype of who that will be it will be it will be technically very complex uh, complex code. It will be difficult to maintain, implement, and whatever. But the biggest problem is this: it just creates diagrams which are relationships which are not really is a relationship. 
Okay, uh, and and this is let me look a count. Let me show you a counter example again multiple, but this is not multiple in here. There's multiple supertypes. Look, we have for example a circle, and the circle is a figure, and the circle is an actor. So in this case, we say a circle implements a figure and implements an actor. There are types. So this is the type, and this is the type. So we don't take any code from there. We just say here that we believe that the circle at the same time is a figure which has a surface and also an actor which can be moved. So that's pretty reasonable and when we deal with types, not classes, so we don't do inheritance, we don't do implementation inheritance, we deal with types. So on the top they stay only the types, not the, not the classes. So in this case it's pretty, pretty reasonable to have the relationship which is, is a is air. And that's okay, that's good to have multiple supertypes because at the same time the circle is a figure and is an actor. There could be more things like this and that's, that's very good. When you see design like this, it's a sign of a good design. It means that you, in one thing, you are able to accumulate the pro you, you are able to represent the properties of multiple uh, uh, concepts. So each type is like a concept. So there's a concept of a figure, a concept of an actor, and then one implementation which says I can be both of them. That's okay. It's not even it's not only okay. It's very it's very uh, it's a sign of a good design if you do it like this. If I if I can see multiple super types, it means that the, the layout of the types and layout of the classes in the in the program is well thought. So the, the designers they they were really thinking about that. Uh, in a quite good way. Okay. All right, we are moving to, we have about 15 minutes left, so let me show you the quiz, which I show to uh, programmers. So we've, we've done. We've done with inher inheritance. We actually done with the course. So that's, that's it. That's the final bottom line. So I told you everything I believe that I, I knew about object-oriented programming. Quite sketchy. We just had eight lectures. But overall, I think the, the, I covered pretty much everything which needs to be covered, in my opinion, about object-oriented programming. Then you can dive deeper. You can go deeper and see for yourself how, uh, how you can improve your code. If you follow the, the, the principles, if you follow the the concepts which I presented to you, then I believe that your code will improve. At least in my case, my personal case, my personal projects and the projects which I work with and uh, for money, not only for, for not only free and open source, I try to use these principles and they help me. I stay away from inheritance, I stay away from static things, I stay away from, from null references, from from getters, setters, and everything I, I explained to you. And of course, I need to, to mention that it's not always possible. You cannot always write the perfect code. Sometimes you will have to cut corners. You will have to uh, use static methods. You will have to sometimes use getters. Sometimes you will have to have mutable classes. Sometimes you will need to do some inheritance. It may happen, it will happen in real applications. But there should be, they should be exceptions. There should be exceptional situations when you really need to do that for, because of certain circumstances. For example, for performance reasons. And I think I told you about this in the first lecture. So if the performance demands you to, uh, to, um, you know, to use static methods or to use inheritance or to whatever, then you do it. But it shouldn't be uh, the default way of writing code. The default way for you should be the right way, like I'm, like I'm teaching you. And then when you see the code and something doesn't work as you expect, then you stop there and you change the code and you, and you cut corners and, and go for some special uh, case. Uh, okay, so now that was my disclaimer. So now let me show you the quiz, which I promised to you, and we will discuss the code. So imagine you are a programmer and I am interested to hire you and you are sitting in front of me on the interview and this is actually happening like I had an interview two days ago and I showed exactly this code to the guy who was who was looking for a job and uh, the guy provided me the answers and some of the answers were right some of the answers were not right so now I'm interested to know what you will think about that but I cannot 
I cannot get your opinion, so I will tell you my opinion about this code, how I expect people to pass this interview. So this is Java. We have one class. The class is called parser. And the parser has one property file, one field. The file can be set, the file can be get, and then we can get content, like read the content from the file. We can get content without Unicode, or we can save content. So usually people pay attention to things and, and then I, I judge, I decide who is in front of me by the, by the importance of the problem they, uh, they find. So, of course, some of them say that, look, I don't like the name of this variable. Like five I, file output string or definitely little o is not a good name for the variable. They just, they just jump there and say, hey, that's the wrong name. Actually, not so many people. I'm surprised because many people just don't see that. Some other people say that, uh, look, I don't like that, uh, that this is a string, for example. Look, this is the string. And uh, when I read from the file, then I do a concatenation of the string. So I read character by character. I append to the end of the, of the string and then I return the string. So they say it's not efficient. So we need to use string builder, string buffer or whatever. That's, of course, that's important, but that's that's not the main problem in this class. You, after, after listening to this course, you probably understand that the bigger problem with this design is the bigger problems are the following. Problem number one, of course, the name of the file, of the class, parser. We discussed that. We don't want to have a parser in this system. We want to have parsed content. We want to have parsed file. We want to be downloaded data. We, we, we want to have some noun, some real abstraction of a real world entity. Here, what does it do? It's a parser which gets content. So call it content. That's the name of this class. Content. I encapsulate the file name and I say, I don't know, read or whatever. Or maybe even not read, maybe even better in Java, there will be two string. Something like that. Or maybe two string is not okay because you cannot show an exception, but something like that. So make it new content. Don't call it parser, call it content. That's one thing. And second problem is that you have setters and getters. So they expect me to make new parser, then set the file in there, and then say get content. Again, get rid of that stuff. Pass everything through the constructor. Say new content file. Make it immutable. This, this set file is a bad idea because what is what is made for set file? It is, it is expected that I will reuse this parser. So I will create the parser, set the file, get the content, set the file, get the content. Reusable class. It may be okay or good for performance because we just make one instance of a class. But reading the file, it's a very time consuming operation. Making just one class in Java is much faster operation. So, forget about performance. Let's say make new content, new content every time you need to read. Make it every time. Then they said another big problem. They say save content. That's a crazy design. We have a parser which can save. That's wrong. The design is broken. The parser should not be able to save anything. If you want to save, make it another class and call it, you know, the, another maybe the, the writable content or something else. But this piece definitely doesn't belong to this class. It should be moved out. That's a design mistake, not the implementation. There are, there are many implementation mistakes there, but uh, people don't see the design mistakes. So that's another problem uh, with, with, this, with this parser and, uh, and the content. Another big mistake here is that uh, we have two methods, get content and get content without Unicode. So this one is supposed to read the entire content and this one is supposed to read the content filtering out the, uh, the Unicode uh, characters. There is an obvious code duplication here. You can see that get, the get content is usually is basically doing the same, the same operation except for one single line. So it also reads character by character, but it just filters out in one line. It just makes the filtering. We definitely don't want to have code duplication. So what people suggest to do, they suggest the most, uh, the most, uh, the, the most frequently uh, used suggestion, which I hear is that instead of doing that, just remove this method and pass here the, the Lambda expression or whatever, just special filter. 
and then this filter will be used there and we will check there whether we need to uh, to accept the character or not accept the character this may be not a bad idea in general to 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 go, to do it like this um, but i think that uh, it could be done better it could be done better it could be done through uh, something like uh, something like a stream not the Java stream, but create something which will be uh, which the, the get content will instead of accumulating everything into the output variable, it will re in, and then returning the variable, this get content will rewrite it so that it becomes uh, reactive. So instead of accumulating everything and returning as a package, we just let it stream to us. And then we attach a filter to the class because if you pass the filter in there then it means that a filter will be used always well you will be you will be using the default filter which will accept everything but still it's going to be a filter which will accept requests on every character so you will make this code slower which it's which which it doesn't want to be so passing the filter is maybe a good option if you don't care about the performance but if you care about performance and in general the design it's better to think about uh, rewriting this get content and making it more uh, a, a streaming uh, mechanism not uh, not uh, not uh, the one which accumulates everything in the buffer so that's another another concern another problem which most people just miss Okay, another thing is the synchronized. Again, I'm surprised, but many Java programmers just don't understand that this is a mistake here. So using this synchronized keyword is not, is not helping much because it only synchronized the setting of the file and getting of the file. But the real problem is that you may set the file and then you start getting the content and then somebody else will come in and set the different file name. And, uh, and you will still be reading from, uh, from another file name. And that could be a confusion or you can even bigger problem you can set the file name and then you start getting the content but between these two calls another thread will come in and set a different file name so in your thread you will set the file name you will uh, and expecting this to be there and then you start reading but another thread just injected a different file name and then you will get a really weird uh, bug which you will not understand where it's coming from so what's the solution of course like i said get rid of the setter this one and make this class immutable like we discussed that immutability immediately solves the majority of problems like this one don't think about synchronization don't think about proper locking just make the class immutable and the problem is gone but if you want to keep this class mutable which is a mistake but still if you want to do it then you probably need the locking and some lock mechanism so you need to introduce another field here another lock which you will set there and say i'm locked so don't change the file name and then when you start reading then you drop the lock and then somebody some other thread can can set the lock so you basically need some some sort of a, a gate some sort of a gate condition where uh, uh, the people can uh, uh, where the class can protect itself so that uh, incoming uh, incoming uh, requests from different threads will be will so only one request can should be able to go through that door okay well another problem which uh, some of you probably noticed but uh, again many programmers missed that so look at this code um, i believe we discussed uh, if I remember correctly, we discussed the idea of fail fast, right? Fail fast and fail safe. So this is the classic example of fail, fail safe approach. So we catch the input output exception and then we print the stack trace. So we print the stack trace and some, well, many Java programmers, they just believe that if we print the stack trace, then everything is good. But, in, but, but actually it's not. Because this method, when we say save content, actually the content was not saved. So something went wrong. The file is missing. The directory is not there. The file system is, I don't know, something. Something is wrong. The input output instruction. What we do, we just print it to the console. We don't know who will catch that in the console, who will see it in the console. Maybe, it's a, maybe the console is even shut down, so no output is going there. And then we continue the execution. 
so the code continues running. So we, somebody asked us to save the content. We didn't do it. We didn't do what we, what we were asked to do. And we just quietly continue, we just quietly return back and say, yeah, we did. We, we just saved perfectly fine. Yeah, we printed something to the log, but yeah, if you're interested, you can take a look and see that the file is, uh, the file system is full. So actually we didn't save anything, but if you don't look at the log and yeah, everything was done perfectly. So that's a horrible, uh, horrible example of using, uh, of using exceptions. And when I ask people on the interview, what you would do differently instead of that, some of them say that I would, uh, I would return, return null or I would, uh, but sometimes they say I would throw another exception. They say I would throw here sometimes throw some new, some runtime exception or whatever. So re-throw basically. So using this E, you just re-throw and, and the method fails. But then I ask them, okay, if you do it this way here, uh, then what about this method? And they don't see the, in the inconsistency between the design of this method and the design of that one. This one actually throws an exception. This one doesn't throw an exception, but catches the exception. So that's again an inconsistency of the design so you're not supposed to have in one parser two methods behaving some some with such a with such a big difference one of them throws an exception another one catches the exception and throws something else but that inconsistency people people see quite rarely uh, another thing which i pay attention to is Well, that's now, now it's a lower level, no lower level mistakes because this reading is definitely is done uh, not effectively. So we are basically reading uh, uh, symbol by symbol, byte by byte, and then we store that information into into the, the the string. So it's extremely ineffective, extremely wrong idea to read the data from the file like this. So you need to have a you need to to read in 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 portions in black block in big blocks and then put them into blocks. Uh, also, I believe that this design is wrong here. So when you say while like this, so you combine in one line of code, you combine assignment and comparison. And that's a good, and that's a bad idea in general. Um, it's a well-known bad idea. It's coming from languages like C. So they invented this for, I don't know, for, to save the to save the, num the, the, the amount of the number of characters they need to type. Maybe that happened like 40 years ago when every character cost them some, some time to type and to, to move the cursor to the light, right position. But now we don't do it like this. This is a very, this is a very bad uh, style of writing the code. You don't do it like this. In my opinion, in general, it's better to write it like this. While, true. I know that many people would disagree with me, but I believe this is, this is a good style of writing. While, true. And then you do data. Uh, uh, data uh, equals to i.read. And then you say if data uh, more than zero, whatever, or less than zero, less than zero, then you do break. And then you close the while. So you loop, I, I actually design this, I design loops this way always. So I always use while true. And then I explicitly say in inside the loop, I explicitly say when I want to start the, to stop this, this, this loop. And I think this, uh, this actually is a uh, is better design for most cases, not for all cases, for most cases. You can find a discussion on Stack Overflow about this, about this while true. And uh, people say that uh, in some cases, I, I think I also posted something there. They say that in some cases this is better, but in, in certain cases it's not. So read the discussion. But definitely in this case, this definitely looks ugly. Because it's hard to read, it's hard to understand, you do at the same time the assignment and then the comparison. It shouldn't happen like this. Okay, and maybe something else. So back to the link, you can go to the to the to the GitHub repository and play with it, show it to your colleagues. Maybe after this uh, discussion, after this 
public uh, public announcement of my opinion about this code. Maybe some people will read it and will prepare for the interview. But still, even sometimes I see that people after after reading the code, after preparing for the interview, they know that I'm going to ask about this code. They still cannot explain certain things, for example, about this parser, about the the, the inconsistency of the, the saving and, and, and getting the content uh, functionalities. It all needs a certain understanding in order to explain it properly so that I understand that they understand. Uh, Okay, one comment from one of you guys on the on the chat. So you're saying that the problem with the quiz is that the, they don't know what to expect and uh, uh, what to analyze, how to how to criticize the text. And, um, uh, yeah, definitely it happens. That, that, that's why I ask on this interview. I ask, what do you in general think about the code? So some people pay attention to performance. Some people pay attention to. Uh, you know, I had an interview, you know, a few months ago, and one person said that uh, this code, I would rewrite it in Kotlin. So I would use Kotlin, and in Kotlin, this code would look shorter. And then he started to show me in, in, in every second line, like, look, this, this approach is wrong. The Kotlin does it better. And here, and I had to stop him at some point and said, yeah, I understand that there's a, another language which does it more compact way, but let's get back to Java and imagine that we're in the Java repository. So let's please stay with Java. So uh, it, it depends on what you're talking to. But in general, I, I believe that this code may be a good, may be a good um, you know, a test for overall uh, level of a person who's in front of us. Okay, so that's it. I think we're finished with the course. Thank for, thanks for being with me. Eight lectures. Uh, good luck with your object-oriented programming in the future. Good luck with your coding practices. I um, I hope that you will enjoy it because uh, my personal experience is that I didn't enjoy it for I don't know 15 years. I really hated my programs. I really didn't enjoy the uh, the coding experience. I didn't like being a coder. It was for me like something that uh, you need to do in order to make money, not that you enjoy. But then when I started to write code differently, then everything changed and I started to I started to enjoy uh, coding and enjoy looking at my programs and I get back to the programs which I wrote three, five years ago and I open them up and I like what I see in some, in most cases and I like to, country, to, to, to make changes and continue making changes in these programs. I hope you will have the same feeling uh, after the course. Thanks very much. That's it. Bye-bye.